Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. The name is Harry Cruz and today we will be continuing our Fighting Fantasy Game Book playthrough series on Book 2, The Citadel of Chaos. Now, I'm not sure if you've watched our previous parts, but if you haven't already done so, please continue from Part 1. And this That will be our first game playthrough of The Citadel of Chaos book. Now, what I'm going to do... Bear with me. Is I'm actually going to go all the way back to the beginning. Now, if you haven't read if you haven't read the introduction already of the Citadel of Chaos, essentially we've been sent on a mission to go to the Citadel and fight this sorcerer, uh, Balfour's Dyer. But I'm going to go straight from the beginning again because there's a few key items that I believe has prevented us from actually going further into the book that we didn't pick up on our first playthrough. Hence, we kept going through in part three and a couple, or even three, um, deaths of our main character despite having fairly good stats at the time. So um, I'm going to revert back to page one again. So we're back to having all of our magic spells, our stamina's at full, luck's at full, skills at full. We've got 22 stamina which is very high, 11 skill which is also very high and 8 luck which is about average or so as well. Okay, We've got one scroll of stamina and one scroll of luck. We've got a backpack, lantern, leather armor and sword, scroll of ESP times two, which is essentially mind reading, scroll of strength, scroll of fire, so you can like torches or shoot a fireball, and there's two of those, scroll of fool's gold, basically fake gold essentially, scroll of creature copy, which is self-explanatory, you just copy the creature in front of you, scroll of levitation, two scrolls of shielding to protect you, and a scroll of illusion and a scroll of weakness. Now, the reason why I've wanted to start again from page one is because in the courtyard and in the first entrance way into the citadel, there was a couple of routes that we didn't take. Um, in part two, I believe, um, if you recall, we went actually down straight away into the leprechaun room, but there actually might be a alternative route. So um, without further ado, I'm going to see if we can find some more items um, to help us on our way to the... Um, to fight the citadel basically i think the key is is to find that hairbrush wherever that hairbrush is because if you recall in part three once once again um there was a room where there was this lady that shooted fireballs at us but sh there were one of the items that was required i reckon that may be of use is the hairbrush so i'm going to read through this all over again um so just for your information okay and there will be a few different entries that i will go for this time as well so let's just let's continue and see how this goes, all right? So, without further ado, let me, uh, let me read it. The sun sets. As twilight turns to darkness, you start to climb up the hill towards that foreboding shape silhouetted against the night sky. The citadel is less than an hour's climb. Some distance from its walls, you stop to rest. Gazing up at the fortress, a sense of dreadful foreboding fills you like a fearful spectre from which there is no escape. The hairs on your neck prickle as you look towards it. You brush your fears aside and with a grim resolve march onwards towards the main gate, where you know guards will be waiting. You consider your options. You have already thought about claiming to be a herbalist, come to treat a guard with some fever of some kind. You could pose, of course, as a trader or an artist, perhaps a carpenter. You could even be a nomad, seeking shelter for the night. As you ponder the possibilities and the yarns you may have to spin to the guards, you reach the main trail leading up to the gates. Two lanterns burn on either side of the portcullis. You hear muffled gruntings as you approach, and two misshapen creatures step forward. On the left stands an ugly creature with the head of a dog and the body of a great ape, flexing its powerful arms. Its opposite number is, indeed, its opposite, with a head of an ape and a body of a large dog. This latter guard approaches you on all fours. It stops some metres in front of you, raises itself on its hind legs, and addresses you. Which story will you opt for? Now I recall we actually posed a herbalist last time, and that seemed to kind of work in our favour. Um, we, we had to give a name of some kind, and they said, okay, e even if they didn't recognise the name, we can test our luck. So I reckon that would be a really good um, option for us. Um, obviously there's a tradesman job, um, job, there's, there's also the tradesman uh, role as well that we could perhaps claim as, but I reckon 
The herbalist. We'll go over the herbalist again. The ape dog asks to see your herbs. Luckily, you grabbed a few handful of wheat on your way and you show them. Cocking its head to one side, the creature eyes you suspiciously. It asks you for the name of a guard you have come to treat. Something you hadn't planned on. You quickly think of a name to bluff the creatures with. If you wish to suggest the name Krilltrog, Pincus or Blag. I think we chose Pincus last time and that didn't, that didn't work. And Blag to me just implies that you're just blagging and I think that's an obvious answer that isn't true. So that's quite uh, Krill Trog, the first option. <laughs> the ape dog laughs and tells you that Krill Trog is a lazy good for nothing and it's not worth saving. You breathe a sigh of relief as he walks back and shouts to the gatekeeper. Moments later the gatekeeper appears and opens a small doorway to let you in. Oh brilliant, we didn't even need to test our luck that time guys. We now know a key way into the, the uh, entrance way. Turn to 251. Okay. This is why I think we may try a different um, approach this time, guys. You walk forward into the spacious open courtyard surrounded by large walls. Various lights are burning and groups of figures are shuffling around in the darkness. In the centre of the courtyard is a large monument of some kind, perhaps a fountain? Looking across the yard, you can see what appears to be the main entrance to the tower. What will you do? If you want to creep around the walls towards the tower, turn to 222. To stride boldly across the courtyard, 179. Or to tiptoe through the shadows towards one of the groups. Now, in this description, straight away, obviously, we are missing key items. Um, to get to the next stage that we got to in our last playthrough. Which makes me think that maybe one of these groups may have some kind of information or some um, other option that it presents us which allows us to gain these items. So I reckon we should tiptoe through the shadows across um, towards one of the groups. Um, creeping around the walls towards the tower and the boldly across the courtyard, if you remember, I believe um, allowed a invisible apparitional guard to try and attack us and we had to use our shielding spell to prevent arrows from hitting us across the courtyard. So I reckon shadows um, to one of the groups would be a good idea. So this is a different option, so let's see what this one takes us. Okay. Cautiously, and keeping one out of sight, you creep through the darkness around the edge of the courtyard. There are two groups of creatures in front of you. To the right, you can see two human-like figures talking under a torch fastened to the wall. To the left, a group of four creatures of varying shapes and sizes are sitting around a fire eating. Will you approach the two by the torch? Or the group around the fire. Interesting. So this is a different option, as I said. It has given us two different options, of course. Um, the humans, human-like figures, talking under a torch, fastened to the wall. And yet, the four creatures sounds like quite an interesting one to look at as well. I reckon the group around the fire, possibly, as our first. They're talking under a torch fast to the wall, they obviously don't want to be interrupted. Um, yet around the fire eating implies that we can just join them and we can probably blend in better. Um, which may allow us to get across the courtyard unnoticed. So let's try the group around the fire. Ooh. Some sort of picture there. Nice artist, uh, artistic drawing there. I love the art in these books as well, they're brilliant. A motley crew sit around the fire. A warty-faced orc is handing out scraggy chunks of half-cooked meat to the others. A snarling dwarf with green skin is complaining about the size of this piece, while two scruffy goblins, a man and a woman, are cuddling each other. They giggle and laugh, and they so often she slaps his ugly face, causing more merriment. As you approach, they stop and turn around to look at you with unwelcoming faces. They sneer at your neat appearance and the female goblin whispers some comment to her companion. In front of the dwarf you can see an open box. You can make out a few rolled up pieces of parchment within it. How will you respond to their cold reception? If you want to sit down with them around the fire, turn to 134. Or to ask whether you may join them, turn to 149. Well, I don't think asking. We don't need to ask, surely. 
we can just sit down. I mean, the reason why we're there in the first place, of course, is so we can sit down. So I presume it's a communal fire. So let's just sit down. Okay. They are taken back by your audacity. Rather than waiting for them to talk, you act aggressively and demand to know how to get into the citadel. They point to the main entrance, obviously a little bewildered by your confident manner, and whisper amongst themselves. The orc tells you that you will need to, the password Skimitar to get in. You ask about the contents of the box, whereupon they get agitated. I reckon um, there'll be some items in there. How do you wish to proceed? If you want to press them for more information about the box, turn to 60. If you think it's best to leave them to it, you can instead head towards the two men you saw earlier by turning to 269, or you can press on towards the black tower, turn 245. Let's press them. The group becomes suspicious as you press them for information. The dwarf springs to his feet, brandishing a wooden club, while the goblins and orc grab swords and glare at you. You will have to fight them. You may either use a magic spell, a levitation spell scroll for 1, turn to 33, an illusion spell scroll, turn to 295, or alternatively we can draw our sword and fight, turn to 213. Now I think, you know, we've faced the goblins and orcs before in the previous book, the Warlock of Firetop Mountain, and they didn't have the best stats. And if you look at our stats here, we're actually definitely above average here, nearly peak stamina and peak skill, so I reckon we don't need to use a spell here at all. I reckon we can fight them um, all three. So let's see how we go. All right. So I may uh, <laughs> maybe wrong. We'll see how we do. But I reckon we should just fight them and see what's in that box. Ready? Let's do this. So you draw your sword just in time as the dwarf is almost upon you. You must fight. I'll explain briefly the rules. Uh, obviously, given this is an escape as well, which is nice. An escape option basically just means you flee the battle. Um, Basically, the 5 skill there means plus 5, we've got 11 skill plus 11, we have to roll 2 dice each, whoever has the highest number causes damage to the other player. Um, we can also use luck as well to reduce our undertaking of damage or increasing our damage to our opponent as well, depending on how well we roll. Um, but I think given how, luck, how low our luck is, I think it's best to leave that out for now. So without further ado, let's fight. As you can see, 5 skill isn't very high at all. Um, but his roll well, was higher, but I think we still make the difference with our huge skill advantage of 11. We did uh, hit him in the end. Let's fight him again. So we tie, which means we're going to get a oh, yep, plus 5 advantage. Yep. And we rolled a 5, he rolled a 2, the lowest roll possible. So we did dispatch the dwarf. Now the goblin. It doesn't specify which the goblin is, if it's the female or the male, but. Yeah, we still win despite us getting lower on the roll. We roll a 9 and you roll, you roll a 6. And we've dispatched the goblin. I presume it may be goblins actually. And we've got the orc as well. Again, quite low skill actually as well. Very high rolls from both actually. We rolled a 12 and they rolled a 11. Again, once again, we've uh, dispatched parts of the orc's wealth and health there. Okay, another roll well, there, there we go, 21, yep, we dispatched York too. Brilliant, we are indeed triumphant. If you beat this troublesome trio, turn 235. Ah, see. Afraid that the commotion of your battle may have attracted attention, you peer out into the darkness. Nothing seems to be happening. Going through the pockets of the creatures, you find eight gold pieces, a copper-coloured key, and a jar of dark creamy ointment. There we are. Turning to the box which you see the pieces of parchment within, which are inscribed with runes. Your heart leaps, you realise that these are spell scrolls, which as, as you well know, are very valuable. Looking at them more closely, you are able to identify them as scrolls of creature copy and enhanced strength. You place them safely in your pack. Brilliant, so that was fantastic. It was really good that we did that. So we've now got a jar of creamy ointment, which I think was an option that we could have used later on in the book. A copper key and eight gold pieces. So we've got gold pieces now, which is excellent. So, and two more spells. So we've done ever so well. I think that was a good 
choice for us. If you wish to head directly towards the Citadel, turn to 245, or if you want to investigate the two men talking by the torchlight, turn to 269. I'm going to quickly put a bookmark here at the top. I reckon we should investigate the two men just to see what they're they're talking about. Interesting figures. The two men are dirty and unkempt. As you approach them, you can as you can hear them arguing loudly about a price of a dagger. The taller of the two is obviously trying to sell a dagger to the other. He argues that the dagger is enchanted and is worth more than the other is willing to pay for it. As you come closer, he grabs you by the arm and asks you for your opinion on the price of the weapon. How will you respond? To tell the pair that it is worth 5 gold pieces, if you believe it is worth 8 gold pieces, or if you think that it should be sold for no less than 10 gold pieces, but we don't really know what the dagger looks like, do we? Can't really zoom in either. I presume that dagger on that right hand page is something dagger, so... Let's just say eight. Let's just go in the middle. Let's just say eight gold pieces. Let's see if we can kind of barter between the two. The tall man agrees and persuades the short man that this is a fair price. The short man mumbles and curses, offering six, then seven gold pieces, but the price has been fixed at eight. If you buy the eight gold, if you have the eight gold pieces, you can offer to buy the dagger yourself, or you can keep your coin and use a fool's gold spell instead. If you don't wish to purchase the dagger, the short man eventually agrees to the price and buys the dagger and leaves. If you want to remain to talk to the tall man to day 83, or you can continue towards the citadel to 245. Interesting. Okay, so we've got another option here. I'm glad we put the bookmark previous. How many gold pieces do we have? Remind myself. Eight gold pieces. We actually have eight gold pieces, so we could in theory buy the dagger. However, I don't think we need to necessarily, but we've got the Fool's Gold spell and I don't think there's going to be many other opportunities for us to use it, so why not use the Fool's Gold spell? Okay, the dagger is indeed a work of art and was undoubtedly worth a fair price. The blade is made of shiny metal and the hilt of it is a particular green leather inlaid with stones. You read an inscription which tells you that it is an enchanted throwing dagger which never misses. In a future combat, you may use this dagger to throw at an opponent. It will automatically inflict two stamina points of damage without the need to roll for attack strength, but you may only use it once. You put the dagger into your belt and set off towards the citadel. Oh, how about that? Two, four, five. Excellent. Ooh, what's this then? You set off towards the sit. I think this is new. You set off towards the citadel. Although the, the night air is calm, you hear a faint whistling, which rapidly gets louder and louder, until a strong gust of wind suddenly hits you with such a force that you can barely move against. You shield your eyes until the blast retreats slightly, and as you open them, you see a ghostly female face inside what appears to be a living whirlwind. She mouths words at you, but you cannot make out, but some seconds after she has finished talking, the message reaches you. She seems to find your appearance offensive and is challenging you with words of abuse. You, you grab at your sword, but she laughs. If you ignore her and continue walking, turn to 161. To stop the talk, turn to 390, or you could use a spell scroll against her by turning to 47. Hmm. Well, she's a whirlwind, isn't she? I don't think us um, attacking with the sword, which isn't an option anyway. Ignoring her, I don't think will be wise. Perhaps a spell scroll? What spell scroll would you like to use against the whirlwind? A creature copy spell scroll? An illusion spell, or if you wish to try a levitation spell, scroll turn to 259. I don't like those options, to be honest. Or if you have none of these spells, you will have to retreat towards the monument in the centre of the courtyard and hide from her. Well, let's just retreat, shall we? 
Yeah, well, you just legged it at me. That's fine. You cast your eyes over the strange structure. It appears not to be a fountain at all, but a temple of some sort. To one side there is a door, which you may investigate, or you may press on towards the citadel itself. I reckon we should press on. There was the three uh, drinks in there, but I think, from what I recall, we're still on max health, so we don't really need it. So I reckon we should just press on forwards. As you stride open, uh, across the open courtyard, you notice that you are walking alongside a small mound, almost like a buried pipeline running from the Black Tower to the temple. You bend over to investigate it. Could it be perhaps have been made by some mole of some kind? As you touch the mound, it caves in, and to your horror, a long grey tentacle covered in warty growths bursts out of the ground and wraps itself around your leg. Oh dear. How will you fight this thing? Draw your sword? Levitation spell or a fire spell would be best. I think we just drew our sword last one. I think it worked quite effectively. You draw your sword and hack at the tentacle. The tentacle will not fight back like a normal creature, but instead is trying to drag you into a large hole into the ground which it is opening around its base. It isn't trying to hurt you, but it's instead trying to get a firm grip on you. It won't deal you any damage during this battle, but if it manages to score three hits against you, it will succeed in dragging you into its lair. You must fight. Okay, so yeah, two stamina, six skills. So one hit against this tentacle. That'll be the tentacle finished. There we are. All done. We do indeed defeat this foe. In front of you is a large wooden door, firmly locked. You may either knock three times for the guard or use a strength spell to try and open it. Now we have the password now, don't we? As you can see on our description here. Knowledge. Password is scimitar. And we've got an enchanted dagger, which is brilliant, as you can see. The door opens and a large, brutish creature steps out. It has a sharp horn in the middle of its forehead, and its skin appears to be armour-plated. It grunts and asks you what you want and demands the password before letting you in. We do indeed know the password, so we can say it, can't we? Do you remember the password? If you think Scimitar, turn to 371. If you believe it's the Ganges, turn to 255. Or if you think the password is Kraken, turn to 49. Ganges, of course, are the evil creatures up at, in that little room with the, the uh, small heads. But it is indeed Scimitar. The creature grants its approval and opens the door to let you in. Excellent. I've just saved our bookmark there. You are in a narrow hallway. This continues for several meters and ends in a doorway. Halfway along the passage you can see an archway where some steps lead downwards. Now, if you recall, we at the end of part one, start of part two, we went, actually went down the steps in the end of this room with the leprechaun. But I reckon we should go straight on this time. We've got a few items now. Yep. Jar of ointment and a copper key, um, but we're still after the hairbrush, aren't we? And a few other things. So, let's try and go forward towards the door and see if we can find another option for us. You try the handle of the door, and it turns opening into another hallway. Some distance along, the passageway turns to the right, and ends shortly in another door. On this door is a sign which reads, Please ring for butler. A rope, evidently a bell, hangs by the door. If you wish to ring the bell as instructed, turn to 40. Or if you want to try the door handle, turn to 361. Well, tricky one this. We, it wouldn't, if we did ring for the butler, our stealth wouldn't really be very stealthy, would it? We wouldn't be in the citadel without them knowing. However, we did know the password, so they think we're probably some sort of, we're probably meant to be there, right? That's what I I got the impression there. So it may be that if we didn't know the pass, we wouldn't have been able to go through this door. So it might be that that was a very important uh, thing we just did with the, with the with the fire pit there with the group outside. Let's ring the bell. Oh hello! Quite the good-looking fellow, aren't you? After several moments, the door opens slowly, and a hunchbacked, misshapen creature with rotten teeth, ragged hair and tattered clothes stands in front of you. Yes, <laughs> what can I do for you? Growls the half-human creature. I'm expected, you reply. And you walk past him through the door with confidence. 
He is a little bewildered by your manners and stammers, not knowing whether to challenge you or not. Which way is the reception room you demand? He squints at you through one eye and motions towards a left fork in the passageway, a short distance ahead. If you choose to believe the butler and take the left fork to 243, or do you distrust this shifty creature and take the right fork turn to 2? Hmm. Do we believe him? Ask me this, would you believe this fella? <laughs> well, he does seem bewildered, as it says in the description there, which makes me think his natural role is, you know, being helpful and he wouldn't not be honest, would he? So I reckon we should actually believe the butler in this case, take the left fork. But we've got a bookmark anyway that I've put at the front of the citadel again, so hopefully that'll be fine, so let's believe him this time. The passage runs along for several metres and ends in a door. You listen at the door and you can hear deep heavy breathing coming from inside, as if some large creature were asleep in there. Cautiously you try the handle and the door opens. Just inside, although the room is dark, you can see that a very large goblin-like creature is asleep on the floor. Do you risk tiptoeing into the room or return to the fork and try the right hand passage? Well, we've gone this far. I think we're quite stealthy. Let's try tiptoeing. See what happens. Oh, hello. Quite a well-built creature, that. You tiptoe into the room. The room is gloomy and the air is damp. A crude wooden post is nailed to one wall with several hooks on it. There are two doors in the far wall leading onwards. On the post hanging on the wall is a makeshift mirror, but as your torch lights up the mirror, its reflection is thrown across the eyes of the sleeping giant who grunts and stirs. One eye opens, then another, and seeing you it springs to its feet, it grabs an axe which it was using as a pillar, and quickly undoes the leather sheath to reveal a sharp bronze head. This giant creature is known as a gark, large and brutish, Gark's a half goblin, half giant, bred by master sorcerers for their aggressive character. Although somewhat stupid, they are rather tough beasts with a warlike nature. What will you do? Well, if they're, st if they're stupid, they're gonna like attack us and they're tough creatures. I don't think apologizing is a good idea. Making a dash to the doors, I mean, he's quite a fit, you know, from what the picture the tea tales, they will probably, probably catch up with us. Presuming it's a he, obviously. Um, drawing our sword and readying for a fight, it'll be a tough battle, but we probably could do it. Or we can use a spell scroll, which, why not? Let's use a spell scroll here. Ah, that's what I was thinking, actually. Which spell will you try on the Gark? You can try and choose the following. Fool's Gold spell scroll, which, well, we've already used that one. Creature copy spell scroll may work. ESP for the mind reading one, but... I think we can kind of gather what he wants to do and probably attack us. Weakness spell would probably be a good idea, though, I reckon. He is quite the, you know, from the picture, quite a muscular type um, opponent. So let's try the weakness spell. You cast the weakness spell with the aid of your scroll and the creature stops in its tracks. Not quite sure what has happened to it. With some effort, it picks up its axe and comes towards you. But it is definitely evidently not such a strong adversary as before. You draw out your sword to finish the gark off. Excellent, so it did work. You must fight. Ah, so it has been uh, minimised its power then. Five stamina and five skill. So you rolled a ten, you rolled an eleven, but there we go. Did attack him. Seven, me, he rolled a five. One more should do it. We are indeed triumphant. Let's turn to 180. The great gark lies dead on the ground. You wait for a minute to see whether the uh, commotion will attract any guards, but all appears safe. You, grow f you go through the creature's efforts, but find little value. Inside is a pouch strung around its waist, are six skull pieces, and an ornate hairbrush. 
That's the hairbrush we're after, I think, for that creature. You add these to your haversack and continue onwards. Turn to 99. I think we're doing okay, guys, now. We've got quite a few items. Leaving the chamber, there are two doors in front of you. You wish to take the left-hand door, turn to 52, or the right-hand door, turn to 38. Well, I think I'm going to leave this entry, this part 4, um, here now, guys, of the Citadel of Chaos. I hope you're enjoying the playthrough so far. I think from our um, character here, as you can see, we've not had test our luck once at all yet. We've now got a jar of ointment, a copper key, and a hairbrush, as well as an enchanted dagger. We've got one less spell of the um, fool's gold, um, but we have got 14 gold pieces now, and a bit of knowledge about the passwords. So I think we're doing a lot better on this run for in hindsight now, guys. So I think, yeah, we're doing good. All right, but um, I will put a bookmark here as well. And I will think I'm going to call it part four here. But if you like the video, please like and subscribe. It will be really helpful for my channel to help it grow. It will be helpful for the algorithms too. And I will release the next part, part five, in the next couple of days or so. Hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Take care. Bye.